SpaceX have been dominating the launch market for years, driving costs down and launch cadence up, and the secret sauce to their success is first stage recovery. While Starship is the pinnacle of rocket reusability, there's only one rocket today that is doing it on a regular basis, and that's Falcon 9. Of course, you know that you're a space nerd like all of us, but do you actually know the details of the recovery fleet behind the action? Do marine assets actually suck? Way back when, in the days when the Space Shuttle was retiring and expendable vehicles like Atlas V, Delta IV, Ariane 5 and Soyuz were the prime spaceflight workhorses, a certain Elon Musk dreamed of making rockets reusable and thus lowering the cost of access to space. Some early Falcon 9 flights tested out using parachutes to recover the first stage with a soft splashdown in the ocean similar to the Space Shuttle's solid rocket boosters and in more recent times Rocket Lab's Electron. However, parachutes were nowhere near ideal. The first stages broke up in flight before the chutes could be deployed, so it was back to the drawing board for SpaceX. One thing was the Falcon 9 first stage was pretty large, being 30 meters tall. Parachute recovery works well for small rockets, model rocketeers have long known this, but using chutes is problematic for larger rockets as more chutes are needed and if the splashdown is even a little bit more energetic, the rocket could be seriously damaged. The one and only flight of the air Series 1X is a perfect example of this. The first stage, a shuttle SRB with a faux segment bolted to the top, splashed down too quickly due to issues with the chutes. A big, nasty dent was made in one of the steel cases as a result. So with the next iteration of Falcon 9 being even larger, the version 1.1 that is the basis of the rocket we all know and love today, SpaceX needed a new way to recover the rocket. Enter Grasshopper, a Falcon 9 V1.0 sized vehicle outfitted with one Merlin 1D engine and fixed landing gear. It tested out vertical takeoff, vertical landing techniques at the test facility in McGregor, Texas, which had never been done with a vehicle of this scale before. Following multiple hops of success, it stood aside for the F9R Dev 1. The F9R was more representative of the Falcon 9 that would actually perform these landings after customer paying missions, being the size of a V1.1 booster with three Merlin 1D engines and retractable landing gear, although they were never retracted and extended in flight. Later, grid fins were added, which helped SpaceX acquire the knowledge on how to aerodynamically steer a massive flying tube of aluminium. The F9R performed a number of successful tests before exploding in flight due to a sensor which caused the rocket to deviate from its normal trajectory. Along with this groundbreaking vertical takeoff vertical landing recovery method, SpaceX needed somewhere for the boosters to land with both ground pads and autonomous spaceport drone ships being constructed. But why do we need two recovery methods, which would come to be known as return to launch site or RTLS and drone ship recoveries respectively? In the simplest form, fuel consumption. For lighter payloads and even modern day ISS Dragon missions, the Falcon 9 booster has enough propellant left over to boost back, enter the atmosphere and land. The boost back burn by itself is a huge change in velocity as the booster needs to stop its downrange motion and then start accelerating in the direction back to the launch site. This is obviously not possible with heavier payloads which is why drone ship recoveries only include an entry burn and the landing burn. And of course, on the rare occasion that a Falcon has to carry more than it can recover with, the entire vehicle, or maybe just one core in the case of Falcon Heavy, is expended into the ocean. For an average Falcon 9 mission, SpaceX can pull an RTLS with a maximum of around 12.5 metric tons of payload. For a drone ship recovery, that number extends up to around 17.5 tons, with any number beyond that ending up being expendable, with the capabilities for over 20 tons to LEO. But a big old disclaimer here, Every mission is different and customer requirements vary on more factors than we have time for in this video. As Falcon evolves over time, SpaceX gathers more and more data, which allows them to increase the efficiency and therefore performance of the world's most reliable rocket, which is why nowadays Dragon missions can RTLS when in the past they couldn't. So now that we have an understanding of what propulsive landing is, how it works and the various methods SpaceX has at their disposal, let's take a look at the development of the drone ship. The first autonomous spaceport drone ship was modified from an existing Marmac 300 barge with work finished by December 2014. 
The ASDS was sent out into the Atlantic for the CRS-5 mission to start off the new year, and on the evening of January 10th, CRS-5 took to the skies, and the first stage attempted a landing on the new drone ship. This landing didn't land softly like everyone hoped, due to a shortage of hydraulic fluid for the grid fins. During repair work for the first attempt, the ASDS was named Just Read the Instructions after a spaceship featured in the books of Ian M. Banks' Culture series. The next attempt in April 2015 also failed, and the first Just Read the Instructions was retired in May. That's right, there's more than one Just Read the Instructions. JRTI was replaced with a new ASDS, which was named Of Course I Still Love You, again, named after a spaceship in Ian M. Banks' culture series. You may now be noticing a pattern. The drone ship, based on the Marmac 304 barge, was sent out into the Atlantic to support a landing attempt for CRS-7's first stage, but it never got the chance due to a failure in the second stage and launch anomaly. To this day, CRS-7 remains the only in-flight failure of the Falcon 9. There was, however, light at the end of the tunnel. In December 2015, the Falcon 9 returned to flight after the CRS-7 failure, carrying the Orbcom 2 payload. The first stage performed a historic successful RTLS landing, which gave hope that the first stage landing concept was viable. But this success didn't immediately translate to landing successes at sea. By January of the following year, two drone ships were in service. Ockersley gained a sibling, the second just read the instructions. While Ockersley was based on the east coast, the new Marmac 303 based drone ship was based on the west coast and would support SpaceX's first mission of 2016, the Jason 3 launch out of Slick 4 East at Vandenberg. 2016 started out with failed landing attempts on both coasts, on both ASDS ships, but crucially, they came close to succeeding. Finally, on April 8th, the CRS-8 first stage successfully landed on Of Course I Still Love You. Over the coming months and years, more successful landings were taking place, interspersed with the occasional failure. The concept was being proven, and data was being gathered with every attempt. Eventually, a third active drone ship was needed, as SpaceX rocketed up in cadence. In February 2018, a shortfall of Gravitas, yes, named after another spaceship in the Culture series, was announced. ASOG was finally completed in the summer of 2021, two years after it was first slated to enter service. Sea trials for a shortfall of Gravitas were conducted in July 2021, and ASOG was the first ASDS that demonstrated that it didn't need a tugboat to get to its station at sea, but that's a topic for a little bit later. Upon delivery to Port Canaveral, the deck showcased another development in the drone ship, which was the shape of the wings, which tapered in. This drone ship, which was developed off of the Marmac 302 barge, was first used for the CRS-23 flight in August of the same year, and as of the time of publication, no landing set for ASOG has ever failed. For those of you who regularly tune into our launch broadcasts from Florida, hearing just read the instructions in the Pacific, and of course I still love you in the Atlantic, won't sound right, and that's because the ships swapped coasts alongside the introduction of a shortfall of Gravitas. To support an increased Florida cadence during a Vandenberg lull before ASOG arrived, JRTI journeyed east, and once ASOG arrived, Ockersley journeyed west to fulfill the vacancy at the port of Long Beach. You might have noticed that I've refrained from calling Just Read the Instructions, Of Course I Still Love You, and a shortfall of Gravitas barges, and that's for a good reason. They are much more technologically advanced than your average barge. Visually, they have the wings added to their sides to increase the surface area available for these rocket landings, as well as GPS navigation capabilities and four diesel-powered azimuth thrusters that can lock onto a precise position in the ocean. These vessels, besides having an X to mark the spot for the landings, also have an array of sensors to gather data. After they've been dropped off at the landing location, these autonomous vessels are home to a device called Octograbber. After landing, they scoot out of their little garages and secure the booster, which usually helps avoid situations where the booster topples off the deck. But as we recently saw in the case of B-1058, Mother Nature can still be more powerful. Something else that's powerful is the business end of a Falcon 9 booster, and the decks appear to get battered with flames, let alone the landing failures of the past. So how on earth do the drone ships survive the landings? The inbound rocket stages don't have much fuel left. That's a saving grace should there ever be another landing failure. The stages would also have bled off all but a small part of their velocity when they fire up their engine or engines for landing. In addition, the booster's avionics can sense if the rocket's behaviour is suboptimal and steer it away from the ASDS to splash harmlessly into the sea. 
that, that's harmlessly for the ship, not necessarily the booster. In addition, the ASDS also features a reinforced deck and water lines to cool the deck from the Keralox flame of the Merlins. This helps to protect it from warping and, God forbid, cracking between missions. The ships also periodically go in for some extra love and care. Just a few weeks before this video's release, just read the instructions went in for refurbishment in Charleston, South Carolina. The drone ships aren't the only ships within what Elon called SpaceX's mini navy, however, as they need a tow out to the landing location. In terms of technological capabilities, in theory, a shortfall of Gravitas and just read the instructions could drive themselves to the landing locations, but legally it's not possible and physically it would take much, much longer than with a tow. Historically, tugs have been used to get the drone ships to their landing locations. Currently, Signet Warhorse 3 is stationed on the east coast, whilst Kimberly C is on the west. They are incredibly powerful for their size, which means that if SpaceX is on a tight schedule, they can tow a drone ship at a much quicker pace than a support ship. Speaking of support ships, on the east coast you'll find Bob and Doug, named after the first two males to fly on Crew Dragon, and on the west coast you'll find Go Beyond. Officially, they're classified as offshore supply ships, meaning that they're much weaker at towing than a tug, meaning they can't sail as fast. But during quieter periods, having the support ship tow the drone ship saves SpaceX needing to deploy another vessel. The full name for the drone ship is, as I've said many times already, the Autonomous Spaceport Drone Ship. And that first word is significant, autonomous. That means there isn't anyone on board, which you may think is obvious, but it actually has an implication you might not have realised. When a support ship tows the ASDS to the landing location itself with no tug assistance and following the launch it sails further downrange to scoop the fairings out of the water, who's there to keep an eye on the drone ship and warn other ships about it? With nobody on board, the drone ship can't speak over the radio to communicate with other vessels, which is why in 2019 SpaceX received the first official Coast Guard approval for a dynamic restricted area. This enables the equipped drone ships, which at the time of publication is only just read the instructions and a short fall of Gravitas, to use its own private AIS Aids to Navigation or ATOM to mark a temporary exclusion area around the drone ship. This means that whilst Bob or Doug is scooping up the fairings, the drone ship doesn't need a chaperone and other ships are kept informed that there's a big rocket they don't want to crash into. Once the support ship has successfully recovered both fairings, it will return to the drone ship and a small team of technicians will be deployed onto the drone ship via a basket transfer to ensure that the Octograbber has a firm grip on Falcon and to hook up the tow line to bring the drone ship home. NSF's Julia Bergeron, who's always at Port Canaveral to catch returning boosters, has heard stories in the past that during rough seas, the team of technicians hasn't been able to make it back to the support ship. In this event, there are cots and emergency supplies available on the drone ship to ensure their safety during the homeward bound leg of the trip. So what plans does SpaceX have for the future of their seafaring fleet? The very high launch cadence seems likely to continue for the foreseeable future with no signs of slowing down, so more ships, more better? Although it may appear counterintuitive given the differences in mass to orbit which we discussed at the start of the video, SpaceX may actually start to perform more RTLS recoveries to give the marine fleet more breathing room. But how do you control your customer's payload mass? By being your own customer. In the future, don't be surprised to see Starlink missions fly a lower number of satellites just so the first stage can return to the launch site. With approximately half of SpaceX's 2023 launches being dedicated to Starlink, it would save a huge amount of work for the drone ship teams. That's why, even though more ships would be more better, we're most likely going to see less payload mass before a fourth drone ship. Although ASOG and JRTI can operate in autonomous mode, will they operate autonomously from the port all the way through booster recovery and back to the port with the booster on the deck? Well, the regulations for this are still being worked out and there are safety concerns. Concerns like the ability of remote controllers to communicate over VHF radio as they need assistance from other marine assets. Also, remember how I mentioned that the support ships are much weaker than tugs? Imagine the wear and tear a drone ship's engines would face by doing a trek like that all by itself. They're designed to stay in one spot, not travel hundreds of miles. Maritime rules and regulations have been developed over the centuries, assuming that ships and boats would have people operating on them. 
and the Coast Guard can only enforce US maritime law within the 12 nautical miles of its waters before international law applies and on US flagged vessels. So technically there's nothing preventing foreign flagged vessels from moving into the exclusion area that the drone ship has marked for itself. This can make security challenging. Remember when the Demo 2 Dragon capsule was surrounded by small boats after splashdown? So far we've only discussed the future of the fleet to support Falcon launches, but don't forget about the big shiny rocket that's currently in South Texas. Elon has long dreamt of sea launch platforms for Starship and they nearly got started on two. Phobos and Deimos were decommissioned oil rigs which were bought by SpaceX with the intention of transforming them into floating orbital launch pads. But last year they were sold for scrap, meaning we're going to have to wait a bit longer for sea-based platforms to become a reality. Peter Beck, the CEO of Rocket Lab, has infamously said that Marine is suck. Citing operational costs and just being a general pain in the backside to manage. However, for SpaceX, marine assets have become invaluable in allowing booster and fairing recovery, enabling a higher launch cadence at a lower cost, revolutionising the launch industry. Ten years ago, they were laughed at for putting landing legs on a first stage, and for the past two years, they've been the busiest launch provider on Earth beating entire nations like China. The marine assets not only have allowed booster and fairing recovery, but also have allowed SpaceX to support Crew Dragon flights. NASA shot down the plan to land Crew Dragon on concrete pads with legs, so the spacecraft has to splash down in the sea, being recovered by Megan or Shannon, named after the first two females to fly on Dragon. Since ships that are in port sitting there doing nothing are a drain on cash, SpaceX's support ships can stay out for two missions at a time. We've seen on more than one occasion four fairings returning on fleet cam. We've also seen quick turnarounds of the drone ships to support the ever-increasing number of launches. As things stand, the marine assets are not bottlenecking SpaceX's goal of 148 launches in 2024. Poor weather at the launch pad and landing location are far more prevalent problems. This often overlooked fleet has been the key to SpaceX's dominance and it will continue to be the key for years to come. I'm Ryan Caton for NSF, thanks for watching and goodbye.